for your attention, please. I would like to open uh, after the session for today. It's our great pleasure to welcome Mark Zappelin from the University of Wisconsin, who is an active participant in the email thread that made this workshop possible. He will report to us on fronts from the Free Reports. We're very, very much looking forward. Thank you. So, so let, I, let me first thank Antoine, who unfortunately could not be here, but he really seeded this activity, and also Misha and his team who are hosting this workshop. And I was thinking about what I should talk about here, and the word work and workshop stuck in my mind that this was supposed to be a kind of working meeting originally to really hash out some of the details that have been challenging in uh, moving these experiments forward. And so uh, I thought what might be useful would be to give some overview of what's being done in Ritberg case, a very short outline of case theory experiment. And I'll start by giving uh, an overview of Ritberg case theory. And uh, I'll apologize for some of this material being quite old, but I hope you'll, it'll be useful to kind of put things under one umbrella. Then I'll talk a bit about experiment, leaving the more, uh, more detailed details for tomorrow's discussion, and then talk a little bit more about some recent uh, calculations. Uh, this is my current research group. Matt Ebert is here from Wisconsin. We have a couple of posters outside, including one on uh, ensemble qubits, but I won't talk about those today. So this is really an exciting time to be working on neutral atom quantum information. We now have a number of experiments around the world with these arrays of um, single atoms, single qubits, uh, with you know, numbers around 100 now. And you know the scale here is about 20 microns across this. If you drew a superconducting qubit on the same scale, one qubit would be bigger than the whole wall. So we have this great uh, scaling potential uh, with these neutral atoms, and if we can perform high fidelity uh, quantum entangling and gate operations, well, that's a great opportunity. So there's a lot of experiments going on. There's the 1D experiments that we'll hear more on later in the workshop uh, here with 100 sides and atom rearrangement. There's a couple uh, 1D two-side experiments. There's the Zendia work, and also a recent experiment from Wuhan in China doing a two-atom ripper entanglement. Uh, there's a couple uh, 2D experiments. There's the Munich experiment, uh, what we heard on from the area this morning, also with the uh, atom rearrangement, and our 49 uh, side experiment in Wisconsin. <coughs> and then there's also progress towards 3D. So Dave Weiss has been doing very nice single cubic gates in the 3D lattice. Uh, not yet Ritberg, but I know he's interested in uh, adding that to this experiment at some point. So, uh, my goal personally is to take one of these arrays and see if we can make a small scale uh, neutral atom quantum computer with it, and turning the uh, single atom qubits with Ritberg interactions into an actual computing device requires a lot of other capabilities, not just the Ritberg gate interactions, there's also all the issues with loading and cooling and addressing and controlling, but I'm just going to talk today about the, the ripper part of the making gates. So if one thinks about scaling up towards quantum computing, uh, one will need to have error correction at some point, and as a guidance, it's useful to look at what thresholds are for known quantum error correcting codes. So I've collected here some examples of small scale codes ranging from the smallest universal code, the five qubit encoding, steam code, shore code, small color code, small surface code, Golay code, and these are the uh, thresholds or pseudo thresholds in units of 10 to minus 3. And roughly speaking, as the code gets larger, the threshold goes up, which makes things easier. And you can see for these sort of uh, 15 or so qubit encodings, the thresholds are around 10 to minus 3. You can't really scale up with a performance at a threshold because then you would need an infinite number of uh, physical qubits. So probably you need 10 times uh, lower gate errors than the threshold, something like that. Single qubit neutral atom gates in arrays are already available at the roughly 10 to the minus 3 error in our lab and in the uh, Penn State experiments. So you know, a good target when thinking about ripper gates is can you get to 10 to the minus 4 error? That'll sort of put uh, my discussion in perspective. So there's been a lot of work theoretically on Ritberg entangling gates, and there's a whole list of approaches. There's the uh, 
original blockade and interaction gate proposals from 2000. Uh, there's the dressing gate work from New Mexico. Uh, there's the adiabatic gates in various forms. We'll talk about some of those. Uh, there's also dissipated gates. This is a little bit along the lines of what Mikhail was talking about. So protocols have been suggested for dissipative entanglement by pumping into dark states that are themselves entangled states, both for single atom qubits and also for uh, ensemble qubits. Uh, you can do gates between different elements or different isotopes. Hybrid gates, kind of like, for example, entangle a Ripperg atom with a photon or with a, uh, a superconducting qubit. Uh, there are gates that act on multiple qubits at one time, uh, gates for the ensemble encodings where multiple atoms are one qubit, and also Ripper interactions for molecules and ions. So there's a, there's a long list there, and there's a lot of different characteristics these gates have that one can think about. What kind of gate is it? Uh, typically, with the Ripper interaction, these are control Z or C not gates. One could also do other interactions, but this is typically what all the gates have been. And we're concerned about fidelity about speed, about the robustness with respect to various parameters, uh, one of those being the Doppler sensitivity, how much atomic motion can we tolerate, and also the interaction range. So I think about building up our correcting codes and scaling, having a beyond nearest neighbor range is, is certainly very useful. So let me go back to the original gate proposal. Uh, the Jackson et paper, which I think everyone here is familiar with, but let me just remind you once more. So we have two qubits coupling up the Ripper stage with interaction strength I'll call B. So we do a pi, two pi, pi sequence. And in the ideal limit where the qubit frequency and the interaction strength are large compared to the excitation strength, which in turn is large compared to the one over lifetime K rate from the Ripper stage, we get this ideal phase case. So what's the fidelity of that phase gate? That's the ideal limit, but we're not in the ideal limit when we do an experiment. And you can do a back of the envelope calculation, which just takes the dominant errors and adds them together. So there's a blockade error, that is, I, even though I have blockade, I get some residual excitation, which scales as b squared over omega squared. There's a spontaneous emission error, which is the time I spend in the Ripper state, one over omega, times the decay rate, 1 over tau, so it's this error. And then there's some higher order terms, which are things like excitation rate over qubit frequency squared, which will be smaller than this, um, uh, which adds to this uh, spontaneous emission error. There's also a higher order term here, p squared over omega squared. But if I just take the dominant errors and then optimize on the Rabi frequency, I get this fidelity limit for the gate which scales as the product of the interaction strength times the lifetime to the minus two-thirds power. So a little caveat, actually the scaling is uh, minus one-half. There's an additional error term, which I haven't included here, which is there's a phase error in the gate. There's a linear phase error, which is the Rabi frequency divided by the blockade strength. So there's a phase offset. And that can be corrected with an additional pulse. And if I make that correction, I get this minus two-thirds <coughs> So then you say, well, as I go to high N, the van der Waals interaction goes like N to the 12th in heavy alkalis. The lifetime goes like N cubed. So I get 1 over N to the 10th. I should be able to get arbitrarily high fidelity. But it, as Trey mentioned, there's no two level atoms. And this is not one of them. I like it. Sounds good. And uh, so you know, this is not a complete enough picture. And so you don't have that amount of blockade available. In fact, when you excite or couple up to a river level n, you have to worry about the couplings to the neighboring levels. And the largest blockade you can get is just the distance to the next level over. And so that distance scales as the river energy over n cubed at high n. So v is the minimum of that and my um, qubit frequency. And so at high n, that's going to be the minimum 1 over n cubed. Tau scales like n cubed, so it hasn't been constant. So you don't keep winning by going to higher and higher and higher. Yeah. And so asymptotically constant to figure out where the optimum is, you have to do a calculation. And we did that some years ago in this paper for rubidium and cesium. And depending on which angular momentum state you choose, the optimum n is in this range 100 plus minus 20. 
And we found the best fidelity you could get was three numbers. And this was actually, I would say, a serious number in the sense that this is not just the bell state fidelity, but a number for process tomography. Okay, so you can get three nines, which is not that four nine number that we, we wanted. Okay, but let me put this up on this table here and go through these other gates and see what they might give us. And the scaling was this one over B power of two thirds. So there's also an interaction gate which works in the opposite regime of the Rabi frequency is large compared to the interaction strength, which I'm not going to call B instead of B, which was also pointed out in the original paper. And the scalings are a little more constrained here. You really want the qubit frequency to be large compared to omega, large compared to interaction, large compared to the K rate. So I have three inequalities instead of just two. You again do the same kind of back of the envelope um, estimates. And you find, so that's, that's different than the Bohade scale, which I put in red here. And you find this expression for the optimum fidelity optimized over Rabi frequency. And now there's the scaling of uh, not B times tau, but the qubit frequency times tau to the minus 1 half. You put in the, um, you include the multiple Rydberg levels. And then you have to replace this by just the distance of the nearest level. And again, you get a maximum fidelity of around three lines, also from the interaction gate. Sorry, I have that. I have one half there. I think that should be one half. Okay. Again, three lines. So those are those two initial gates. Then there's been uh, work from Sandia on addressing gates. This is based on the off-resonant excitation of the Rydberg levels. So we're, we're, we're coupling up to Rydberg with a detuning uh, delta, uh, uppercase delta, and my lowercase delta is the uh, offset on the first of resonance. And I analyzed this uh, protocol in the limit of being deep in the dressing regime. The gate that was actually done with Sandia, as I guess Matt will talk more about, was sort of intermediate in that they had roughly 50% excitation of the Rydberg level. So it wasn't deep in the dressing regime, and I, I've done the scaling analysis uh, in the dressing limit, and so the performance of what was actually done, I guess, would be limited by something in between the dressing limit and the blockade limit. But if you assume a dressing limit, that limit, this, the, this uh, detuning delta is large compared to the Rabi frequency that puts you in the dressing limit, and then for the gate to be good, you want that to be large to, it turns out, built to the three quarters of the tau to the one quarter. And that comes from taking the dressing interaction, the pi time, to pick up a pi phase shift from the dressing interaction, and then adding up spontaneous emission of blockade errors. And again, you can optimize over omega, and you get an expression for the fidelity, which now scales over delta, one over delta tau to the one half. You include uh, multiple Rydberg levels. You should replace delta y, not more than the uh, Rydberg energy over n cubed. And again, you end up with something like three minus. So these three gates give you potentially three nines in a real atom with multiple Rydberg levels and scalings of um, an energy times the Rydberg y times either the minus two thirds or minus one half. Then there's another gate protocol, which was also proposed in the original paper, three protocols in there, which is this adiabatic gate, where you now address both atoms simultaneously, so you don't have this pi to pi pi, you address both simultaneously with a time-varying Rabi frequency and a time-varying detuning. And if you operate this in the adiabatic regime, where the one and two uh, Rydberg excited atoms follow adiabatic curves, you pick up a phase shift which depends on the accumulated energy of those stress states. And by choosing the parameters of the uh, Rabi drive and the detuning correctly, one can arrange for a pi phase shift between one and two excited atoms and thereby also have a phase gate. However, to be adiabatic, the gate has to be slow. And so the original fidelity estimate was something like 0.98. This gate was then revisited a couple years ago by um, Tomasa Pilarco's group and Ulm and the Palaso group, 
and they optimized parameters, and they found something like 0.99% mistake for that game. And I haven't done the scaling analysis for this, but I'll just write that as 0.99. So, sure, we'd be very happy to demonstrate the game of that fidelity, but it's still too low. Yeah, so, Mark, I actually have a question. So, I mean, I don't know whether this is really a right time, but so, but like, so this, all of these are things, you know, you assume some kind of square pulses, right? You don't assume. That's right, and that's going to make a big difference. I see. Yes. I will okay. be talking. Okay. okay. Absolutely. So, here I'm assuming square pulses. This is yeah. an adiabatic pulse. It's not a square pulse. But for this type of adiabatic pulse, it was actually worse, not better. <coughs> So you can improve all of these by going to low temperature. So here's a plot of the lifetimes of low angular momentum states. Uh, let me see if I can remember here. The P states are in solid lines. The S states are dashed, and the D states are dotted. And then the color codes the temperature. And so if I take uh, P states, which have the longest lifetimes, around N equals 100, that's this red solid curve, I have about 500 microseconds. And if I go to 77K, I do a few times better. If I go to 4K for the P states, I pick up about a factor of six. Zero K doesn't make it any better. So you can win about a factor of six going to uh, lower temperatures. And that means if your scaling exponent is minus two third, you pick up a factor of 3.3 at the gate fidelity, or if it's a half, you pick up a factor of 2.4. So that pushes those numbers up a bit higher. And so here, these are the 300K fidelities, and those are the 4K fidelities. I didn't put it in for the adiabatic. You can do better by going to circular states, which were mentioned this morning. And uh, we wrote a kind of crazy paper a few years ago wondering about uh, whether or not we could do high fidelity gates with uh, circular reverse states. And here's the lifetimes of different states. Here's the S state at 300 Kelvin an S state at zero Kelvin, which is about the same as the circular states at 300 Kelvin. But if you put the circular states in the cryostat around n equals 100, you have these one second lifetimes, extremely long spontaneous emission lifetimes. And if you do that, in principle, you could reach five nines or better uh, for a blockade game. But that assumes that you could near perfectly excite the circular states. And that's a real challenge. There's been some progress on that uh, in the ENS group just recently, but not at five months. So it's a fun paper to write, but I'm not there. Okay. So the scalings are either minus two thirds or minus one half. And that suggests the question, you know, how good can the scaling be? Can I do better? Well, let's say I have two interacting particles have some dipole-dipole interaction or some other interaction mechanism. Could be river atoms, could be molecules, it could be spins, it could be what have you. And let's say I want to use that interaction to create entanglement between those two uh, particles or spins. Well, there, it turns out there's a very useful general result from the, from the Vikings over here, which is that to generate one unit of entanglement, the integrated population of the interacting states is bounded below by 2 over the interaction okay? And they derive this result on the basis of general considerations of the state of two interacting particles. If the states that are interacting to create your unit entanglement are themselves subject to spontaneous emission because they have a finite lifetime tau, that implies that the gate error is bounded below by 2 over B tau. Okay? So that's not a two-thirds or one-half scaling, that's a one over B tau scale. How can we guess it? Well, so let's think about changing the pulse shape. Remember for the blockade gate, the infidelity is this one over B tau spontaneous emission term, and then this omega over B squared uh, blockade leakage term, okay? Where C1 and C2 are some constant prefactors. Now let's suppose I change the pulse shape. So it's not a square pulse shape, but it's some other pulse shape. And let's imagine that pulse shape is such that I get, I'm still going to get something like a 1 over B tau spontaneous emission uh, error that doesn't depend on the pulse shape, but the blockade leakage can drastically depend on the pulse shape. 
And let me imagine it's no longer omega over b squared, but omega over b to some power n. Okay. Now I'm going to solve for omega to minimize the error. I'm plug in, and what I'll find is that the error minimum is now 1 over b tau to this power, which as n goes to infinity, is my 1 over b tau, which is indeed my optimal scale. Okay. So, all right, but what pulse shape should I use to get this? Well, a factor to a polynomial, the power of a factor, as n goes to infinity, what function gives me that? Well, that's an exponential function. It's got a power series, it's got some lower power terms, but asymptotically, it's got n going to infinity. So that suggests, well, maybe a exponential is the place to look. Okay, so uh, why would you call it the okay for a moment and why did I be an error? This is a deterministic case in principle. I wouldn't call it an error, it's just inconvenient, right? No, I disagree. This is, uh, well, so there's this linear phase error in the block A gate, which is just omega over B, and there's the punctures in the front. And then there's the leakage of the population. And the, so that's the amount of RR that got excited. I just bring it down, and I mix it a little bit, and it's just an additional shift that comes up. And I wouldn't call this an, an error, it's just an inconvenient additional phase, which I have to know, but uh, it's not an error. Well, no, because the pulse area of the doubly excited state, this is factor of root 2. No, but I just switch it on. I mean, it's like, like a star shift curve that comes in, it shifts a little bit, it has some inconvenient. So, but it's unless there is a decay, of course, right? If there is a decay during the time. It's a decay, it's a different story, that's why. Right. So I, I gave an example of your old adiabatic gate, and that's 10 times worse stability because you have to go slow to the adiabatic. So I don't think it's a fair comparison to say, well, let me just make this adiabatic, because then it's not uh, as high stability because I've got slow. So, why do you call it? So the gate is perfect if this term is zero and that term is zero. Right. Because then I just have, uh, I got my two pi phase shift on the one, I got my pi phase shift on the one one, and I got my pi phase shift on one zero and zero one, and I have a perfect phase gate. So those two terms being zero is perfect. Is that term that is not zero correctable with a single qubit operation? And I don't think so. The linear phase term is, but not that term. So as the n goes to infinity is optimal scaling, and n goes to infinity so is an exponential function. So let's do a comparison. Here's a uh, master equation simulation of just a simple three-level ladder excitation, where I'm plotting here some curves as a function of blockade. What I mean by blockade for one atom is I'm just imagining that this laser uh, is detuned because of blockade from another atom, which would be part of the gate sequence. And what I'm showing here is the uh, log of the population error in terms of population left behind, population excited, and then this curve that goes lower, the solid curve, is if I turn off the spontaneous emission. And here I'm just putting numbers in for um, uh, excitation through the 7P, which is what we're doing in our experiments with cesium and I've taken a pi time of 25 nanoseconds, which corresponds to 100 nanosecond gate. And the square pulse has this um, quadratic uh, decay of the error with the detuning, which we get from a large block A. You do have these points where you have very low error, but to, to tune into them, you need this incredibly precise pulse time and written down picosecond. So that's for a square pulse. How about a Gaussian pulse? Well, the Gaussian pulse, we do much better. We get this exponential suppression of the leakage. And indeed, the um, if I want to target this point here, there's this dip here in the curve. It's not just an exponential, because I'm taking a pulse with a finite lifetime, so there's a spectral content corresponding to a finite lifetime. So if you're going to, I mean, if you're allowing yourself, if you allow yourself to know what the blockade is, then you can do a much simpler gate, right, with the same optimal failure. That's right, if you allow yourself to know. So then it's. So like, you probably may not want to Well, it. no, but my point is, let's say I know what the blockade is, and then I choose, so with a particular blockade, I choose my pulse time to make this really good for the square pulse. I'm just saying that it's, the robustness is much worse. If I have to tune this to a picosecond, here I can tune the tensor to a second, and still do uh, better. 
But this part of the curve is certainly exponential. So can we use that in a gate sequence? And that sort of led to this uh, work with Frank Wilhelm's group on uh, the river of drag gate. So, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just, just so I understand. Uh, the, so for each of these different, uh, so for each Gaussian pulse, you're actually optimizing on the route of frequency, right? So like as you vary the blockade. No, and this is for fixed Robbie frequency. I'm taking a high time of 25 nanoseconds. And I'm varying blockade. Sorry, I'm I'm, I'm varying pulse time and I keep the Robbie frequency fixed. I think the pulse time. But look at the scales. The high time is 25 nanoseconds. Here I'm varying plus minus 150 picoseconds. So uh, then we looked at this drag gate, lousy acronym, that stands for derivative removal by adiabatic gate. And uh, Frank Wilhelm's group and other people developed these in the context of superconducting qubits, which in a sense present some of the same challenges as the Rydberg experiment. Because in the superconducting qubits, you have this weak anharmonicity, and you need to excite the qubit level without putting population at <coughs> these higher excited levels. We have the same problem, because there's these multiple Rydberg. And so the pulses here are designed as sums of higher order Gaussians with an offset, which just means that the pulse starts and stops at zero and the derivative starts and stops at zero. And so the pulse is the sum of these higher order Gaussians and derivatives of those higher order Gaussians. And then for a given Ripper level you want to target, there are leakage states, for example, neighboring and P states for excitation from one and neighboring P states for excitation down to P. Uh, from zero over here, and one wants to choose the pulse to have zero spectral content at the frequencies corresponding to these leakage levels. And that's what's being done here. So we did that, and then you put that in the master equation simulator, and you see what you get. This is uh, just a unitary error for different pulses, and it's maybe interesting to look that actually the Gaussian for this multi-level problem turns out to be not much better than the square pulse. The square pulse is this dotted line, Gaussian is this dashed line, and then these curves that have the very low errors are drag pulses with some different details in exactly how we set them up, and also the ratio of the Robbie frequency for the control and target qubit. If we include the Rydberg decay at 300 Kelvin, we get these curves here, and we can hit 10 to the minus 4 error at 15 nanoseconds second gate time. And if you put this in a cryostat, you get 5.9. So another feature here is that this very short gate, and indeed this was what was originally promised in the Jack's paper, fast Ripper gates. They have to be fast and they can be fast. Having this short gate time means there'll be less sensitivity to Doppler defacing and integrated background field chips. But Mark, you, you disregard the motion, right? You disregard forces. Yeah, I'm assuming I'm in the motional ground state. That's an additional You disregard the forces, for example, which can have. There's no forces in the blockade here. You only have one well, at the level of, you know, yes, in principle, yeah. But, you know. So the force, you know, ability is 10, four nines, the, the double excitation is less than four nines, four nines, four nines, it's small. Okay, so now I have this scheme. So we have these original gates, uh, dressing gate also, adiabatic gate, the drag gate, the four nines, and what are the scalings? These have these two, minus two thirds, minus one half scaling. I haven't done a full scaling analysis on this, but it's something close to B tau <coughs> minus one with some deficit delta. I don't know exactly what the deficit is right now. I'll just mention, although I can't speak about it in detail, we have another gate scheme in progress that comes from Klaus. This is in collaboration with the Orbis guys and David Petrosian, which involves a dark state, where it looks like we're going to be better than four nines or maybe even five nines, but this is work in progress, working on the details right now. But it looks like we can actually beat this for the next But I mean, so the other quantity is uh, how insensitive you are to the precise value of B, right? So then you can, like, is there, should there like, have another column or something? Well, we, we did look at that. So if you go to this paper here, there's some plots of the uh, fidelity versus um, the strength of the blockade shift. And it's, it's pretty flat. It's a blockade game. And the dark gate, the dark gate is also sensitive. Uh, the dark gate is working on a different mechanism. 
but is it insensitive to the value of B? I mean, if you guys are uh, sensitive, then you can just do No, that thing. one is, is sensitive. If it's sensitive, then you just do some simple pulses and just wait for high phase. You know, so. Well, the optimal Robbie frequency scale with the various parameters, or better yet, um, how does the required laser current optimal wave power scale with, say, N? Yeah, so when comparing gates, I'm just imagining one photon excitation. For our more common two photon excitation, some labs, you need a sufficient power not to suffer from the scattering of the P level. And that sufficient power may be unrealistic, depending on the parameters you want to hit. Um, the Altman Robby frequency uh, increases as you go to these higher fidelity situations. I have the scaling in the papers, but I don't remember. That. So at this point, let me pause for a little bit. We know how to design high fidelity gates. And there's all still the question of experimental imperfections. But it's also the case that experimental challenges may motivate other gate choices. So even though this is high fidelity on paper, that might not be the optimal gate given an imperfect apparatus. So let me talk a little bit about experiment. This beautiful complexity. These, uh, optical setups, and uh, you know what's been done on Ripper gates in the experiment. So there's been a couple higher fidelity, I won't say high fidelity, but higher fidelity experiments. Uh, some work we did with cesium in an array, blockade gates, where we got to 0.73 bell state fidelity, and uh, 0.79 post-selected, and then this beautiful experiment from Sandia with this uh, strong, strong weak dressing regime, I guess, intermediate. Like, blockade and dressing, where they got to 0.81 post-selected and uh, 0.6 without the post-selection. Uh, very nice parity oscillation curves. So those are sort of the two recent demonstrations. These are all the Ripper gate experiments that have been done. There's not enough gate experiments that have been done to the experimentalists in the room. Um, these are the old experiments from us and from the French group. And then we did this more recent experiment, and uh, this is an E experiment. There's also an experiment on the archive now from a group in Wuhan, which is two different <coughs> isotopes, so rubidium 85 and 87. So not a great fidelity, but you know, nice to see another experiment. So, all right, if I ignore these two points and draw a straight line through there, it'll be perfect in the number three or four years. That's not the right scaling. Um, so there's been a little improvement, but it's not been great. Right? And the state of the art, you know, is 10 to minus 3 uh, infidelity now in ions and superconductors. So that's a big gap between that and the calculations. There's a lot of experimental issues. And we'll talk more about these uh, in the session tomorrow morning, but there's laser imperfections, amplitude, frequency, phase, polarization alignment, emotional effects, trap and star shifts, sensitivity to background fields, electromagnetic, also atomic structure. So I'll talk to, give some more details tomorrow, but we can make a kind of um, error budget for the gate that we did and try and estimate where we should be. And there's state preparation and measurement errors. Uh, given our finite temperatures for those experiments, there's a Doppler dephasing term, about 5%. There's photon scattering from the intermediate level. There's a little bit of blockade leakage. We're only at about 20 megahertz blockade. And then there's some unknowns, laser noise, uh, magnetic and electric fields. Current parameters should reasonably put us here, 85 to 90. We measured 73. So we're sort of missing 15%. So where's that 15%? And so here, here's the uh, experiment. We're doing two photon excitation from 6s to 7p to an 82s state with a blue and a red photon, and we're going sigma plus, sigma minus. So we couple from the ground M equals zero state up to the Ritberg M equals zero hyperfine state. And cesium has a lot of hyperfine interaction. So at 82S, you know, the S states have the largest hyperfine. And so the hyperfine interaction, unfortunately, is neither large enough or small enough. Either you want it to be very large, so you just couple the one hyperfine state, very small so you can ignore the structure, but in fact the hyperfine splitting is about 100 kilohertz, which is not all that much different from our 0.65 megahertz Robbie frequency. 
So and we think that's part of the issue. So we apply a magnetic field of about one and a half gauss, we're going sigma plus sigma minus, so we couple to this mj equals minus half uh, mf equals half, mf equals zero state here. And we can drive very nice ground Robbie oscillations. So we start in the ground state, recurve back to the ground state, and we attribute this gap here to our finite recurve detection efficiency. I think it's reasonable to claim that because we know that the blockade is much better than this when we do a two-atom experiment. So we, we must be exciting with the recurve state. So that looks good. But then we have this, what I call hole in my pie, kind of cheap which is when we do this thing on one atom, pi gap pi, we have an extra 15 to 20%. And that's sort of our 15% that's missing in the gauge fidelity in some sense. So why is that? And what we found is that even though we make the gap between these two square pulses as short as possible, we still see a difference between pi, short gap pi, and just a continuous driving. So a couple thoughts about that. One is an alignment issue. So we do our excitation with counter-propagating beams to minimize uh, Doppler. And then we have also a, a B field to find a quantization axis. The polarizations of these beams are probably not perfect. They go through a pretty complicated optical scanning setup. And there may be some misalignment between the axis of the laser beams and the B field. So I don't have pure sigma plus and sigma minus. And that means that we don't excite m equals zero in the Rippert manifold, but we actually couple to several different m sub f states with different clutch Gordon factors. So this is a simulation of the Schrodinger equation with all 48 hyperfine states. So there's 16 in the ground s state, there's 16 in the 7p, and 16 in the Rippert state. Put all those states in with all the uh, angular factors, and here's a simulation of uh, pi. So this is the ground state population going down, the river going up, and then a gap, and then another pi pulse. And here I've assumed roughly 10% polarization errors in the polarization states. And what you see is that although we excite 100% up to the river level, only 85% or so is in the same equal zero state, and the rest is distributed among different M sub F states in river. And then we have a gap, and then those states acquire different Bohr phases in the gap. They dephase, and we don't come back down. We have a missing population. Uh -huh. Even if the polarizations were perfect, since the K vectors are not aligned to the magnetic field, would you all Well, that would correspond to the polarization. So, I see. so you're including that in the 10 degrees off axis. Yeah, so I, um, okay, I don't have on the slide exactly what state I was using, and I don't know exactly what the state is in the experiment either, but it's highly suggestive of uh, reproducing what we, what we see in terms of population. Um, so that, that's one issue that we need better alignment, better setting of our, our uh, polarizations. Another issue is field sensitivity, which Thierry had very nice evidence for this morning as being important, uh, reducing background fields. And the river river matrix elements are huge. That's why we have this great blockade. And when we go from the ground state up to an NS state, that NS state is very strongly coupled to these neighboring NP states with Robbie frequencies due to small background fields that can be on this sort of terahertz level. And so those DC electric fields, again, if I have a pi gap pi sequence, and I have also star shifts on these different states, can also lead to some phases, which will give me population error. So we need to cancel this DC field. And also the AC field will, will drive these transitions. <coughs> and my estimates suggest they can also give errors in the few, few percent level. And those can also be compensated by putting phase shifts uh, in the pulse sequence. So we've been working on some upgrades in the last year. We now also have a cell with eight electrodes inside. You can see the wires here. We're pretty close to getting some data on this. It still looks complicated, but we've revamped our optical mechanics for better stability, and we have some hardware in place now for generating shaped pulses. So these are all things we're working on uh, in the coming months here. So, okay, maybe we can uh, fix these technical issues that are making this pi gap pi not work so well, but another way of thinking about it is, can we make a high fidelity gate with continuous driving? So let's get rid of this gap. 
So the adiabatic gate, as I mentioned, is continuous driving, that's great, but it's only about two nines of fidelity. Could we do better? One suggestion has been to use constant amplitude pulses at finite D2. So if you use a constant amplitude pulse, you get a Rabi frequency omega on the 1001 stage, you get root 2 omega on the 11 stage, and so they can't both work. But if you go to the finite detuning and go enough times around pi, you uh, that and with finite detuning, you get those two Rabi frequencies to sync up and all the population comes back to the ground state. So this was suggested by the Englert group um, and also a group in China last year, but to get the two Rabi frequencies up, you need a lot of pies of rotation, and fidelity is not, uh, not bad, but too correct. So I took another look at this adiabatic gate, and can we be adiabatic, but be rapidly adiabatic? Or an adiabatic rapid passage gate, for example, using arc pulses. So this is uh, our two atoms again. And here I read the pulses uh, of arc form, and then I have this um, exponential type pulse driving omega, and then a detuning, which I've taken as a sine function for the period of the sine function. And it turns out if you keep the same direction of um, scanning of the detuning for the first pi and the second pi, then all three of these states come back to the ground state and all three acquire the same dynamic phase of pi. So that gives you a phase scan. So doing a uh, full simulation of, of this pulse sequence, including spontaneous emission for real atom, I get the fidelities above three times. So actually looks like a pretty nice gate. And this shows how the scaling goes with um, the Rabi frequency. A nice feature here is I can get over three nines of fidelity with only 17 megahertz uh, Rabi frequency. Attractive, and this high fidelity comes at just over three microns close to where our lattice is. So that's an outlook that we're going to try with our um, shape pulse hardware. And just to summarize, I've gone through a lot of different gate approaches. Um, certainly, we know how to design gates now with um, fidelity that's really in the uh, scalable regime for, for quantum information. And it's likely that continuous driving of the ground ripper pulse is going to be more robust. There's certainly data that indicates that. And uh, we'll see if we can beat down all the experimental technical problems and uh, get this to work. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We've had a bit of discussion, but we still have a few minutes for more questions. So. Um, for the status of the pi gap pi, um, wouldn't you expect there to be some time dependence if it's really populating multiple levels, requiring different phases? maybe dependent on the time that they stay up there, but it looks quite constant, and maybe there's even like a dip or something. Like so I have to say with this data, that was sort of what I would call a characteristic, not perfectly repeatable data, that we took this data many times, and we saw different curves. And but we always saw curves with a yeah, population missing even <coughs> for On some occasions, although we weren't able to repeat it, we saw kind of a nice time spike. Level, but it wasn't a computer. So there's some time dependence. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't understand the difference between, which is somewhat related to the previous question, the difference between pi, no gap pi, and two pi. Like, did the light actually. The light was turned off. So in our hardware, we can turn the light off for 150, 200 nanoseconds. So turn it all the way off and then back on as fast as we that gave this data point here. So, yeah. I can't really raise the question to that. So, how, how long does it take for the laser light to actually stay? So, there's a, a ball of time on the, from the AO switch, which is around 100 nanoseconds or something. Maybe that you're limited by light shifts during that time when the amplitude goes down. So yeah, I mean, maybe it's going too fast and you're putting spectral content in other places and putting the atoms on this range, uh, some other state, it's possible. Yeah, I guess the issue is if you're doing a two-fold excitation scheme, then you, have, you cannot ignore the coupling of 
one photon on the other transition, and vice versa, right? So, so I say we tried all these combinations and we turned the lower photon off first, or after, or the upper one off, and did all these combinations and we had that situation. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether a faster rising photon would benefit you. You're, you're picking up the slide shift, which might even fluctuate from around to around. Yeah. Um, the, the gap would indicate that in addition to the polarization uh, problem, there's something to do with the spectral content of, of the light you're applying. Because... Well, my argument with the polarization problem is that it doesn't matter if there's no gap. So I have this polarization problem, and I'm coupling to more than one hyperfine level, which evolve with different pore phases. But I just couple up to the superposition ripper states. And because the driving is strong, I really get close to 100% up there. And I continuously couple to it, and I come back down, no problem. But as soon as I turn off the light, those hyperfine states are evolving with different pore phases. And so they dephase relatively. You would assume some, you would actually expect some meeting actually in this case, like what you showed the data? You would expect something sinusoidal, which is why I say when we saw sinusoidal, we thought, ah, that's probably what it is, but it wasn't repeated. So maybe, I mean, we did not have electric field control in these experiments either. So, you know, we have to tie down these different things. And see what but the 100 nanosecond time scale for the light being off wouldn't explain it given the hyperfine splits. Right. Yeah, that's right. Prior to electric field control, uh, did you notice the river line being stable, or do you think there were plausible fluctuations in the electric field that showed up in the experiment in other ways? Uh, so we measured the electric field in a couple different ways spectroscopically, and it's about 10, 20 millivolts per centimeter. Uh, I don't have enough data on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm just wondering, did somebody have looked into, uh, yeah, uh, into a topological case uh, and see how yeah, you like a geometric phase? Geometric, yeah, you use geometric phase. Uh, so, um, yeah, there is a paper from, from Klaus um, almost 10 years ago now where he looked at um, using geometric phases for uh, doing entangling phase gates. No, no. And in fact, he didn't do any fidelity calculations. Okay, he did it for an entanglement, but not for a okay. Maybe time for one last question. So this is a design choice in that you're using the MF equals zero state. But if the claim is that <coughs> this pi gap pi problem comes from mixing to several different MF states in the river manifold, yeah. wouldn't you gain from having a stretch transition where you go to just by selection rules, you're only coupling to one of these uh, MF states in the river manifold? Um, well, you could then turn on a magnetic field larger magnetic field and separate the MF states, but if you have polarization errors, the selection rules don't save you there. You still couple to other MF states. So I do a two photon op from a stretch state, plus and then plus if I have errors, I'll plus a couple of other states. So it's a very interesting but case. Both to together with a gradient you could hope to suppress. Yeah, with a bigger magnetic field you should be able to suppress these other states better. So this pi gap pi, I mean, it's a little fascinating to say, but experimentally, it should be somehow possible to vary parameters to see if this is the case or not. I mean, you could, on purpose, mess up the polarization, for example. It should get worse. Yeah, that's right. It should um, be proportional to whatever polarization infidelity you have because you populate more levels or something like this. I mean, did you ever take data on that? That's question number one. Question number two, did ever any other group see the same effect? Well, what I forgot to mention, but I think is, is universal, is that all of these gate experiments have seen excess loss. I'm pretty sure Brad would agree with me on that, that there's, there's loss of population, as you've seen in the Paris experiments, it's in India and our lab, that there's missing population when you do this up to revert and back down. And, you know, 
say 10% or 5% or 15%, it depends on which experiment. But that's been a problem with all the experiments, which is why there's this difference in fidelity between post-selected and not post-selected. But I'm a bit confused. I thought the effect that you were describing with this pi cap pi, I mean, you're just populating different Rydberg levels, but they would all fall down again. Uh, you know? uh, well, you know, our measurement of the population is based on the loss of the Rydberg state. So the point is, at the end of the gate, if we left population that was Rydberg excited, that becomes a loss when we actually do the stage measurement. Yeah, I'm not sure if this answers my question, but say, did you try it on purpose? Uh, Break your selection rules by using a wrong, uh, wrong, slightly wrong polarization. I mean, if it's the case what you described, I mean, the effect should be stronger because um, you populate more into different levels. It should be pretty. I wish I could tell you we had more systematic data. Oh, That's see. the best I can give you today. Okay. Okay. That was a good. Okay. <coughs> okay. And with that, thank you, Mark, again.